Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have an upload that is full of encounters that are absolutely mind-blowing. One that, after I narrated it, had me sitting here going, my God, I wonder how many times that happens. Before we get into it, though, a couple links. As you all know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. The merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They all were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And please, folks, leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things, they really do help this channel to continue to grow and go, and they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Today's first terrifying encounter comes to us from Nebraska. My family was born and bred as farmers, generationally, going back 150 years in the state. We have land holdings that reach far and wide, growing both corn and soybean, and I've been a part of it for some 55 years to date. My two sons, who at the time were 11 and 14, had come home after riding their quads through the fields. The two of them had come busting through the back door, screaming and jabbering one over another about having seen some type of monster in the standing corn. Now this field of which they were speaking hadn't been turned under as of yet. So it was comprised of standing dried corn stalks, and we're talking hundreds of acres of standing stalk. After I calmed them down, I asked Arnie, my oldest, to tell me what had happened. He said he and Cole were riding through the southeast field when a huge dog emerged from the corn ahead of them. The two had backed off the throttle as this dog was facing them about 50 yards distance, hunched down on its front paws with its fangs exposed, snarling. He then went on to say the dog's eyes in broad daylight were glowing bright red and twinkling. I looked at the two of them. Knowing that they were good boys and not prone to lying or spinning a tail, and they were both visibly shook up about what they had seen. It was then that Cole, who was the real jabber jaw of the two, started to chime in, saying how big this thing was. He said that its hindquarters were hunched down, were a good four feet from the ground, and its body was 20 inches wide. Now, we have nothing in the area which can remotely fit this description. I personally know everyone in the surrounding area, as well as all the hounds and animals, and nobody owned anything which would fit that bill, of which the boys had just described. During the week which followed, I was extremely busy doing much needed maintenance around the farm and on the equipment, as well as a lot of paperwork, but even in my business, I had realized the boys hadn't fired up the quads once, and this was a passion of theirs, in particular this time of year, so... Having put aside much of my work, I asked the boys to take a ride with me out to where they had seen this dog. For up until this point, I hadn't done so, and wanted to put this thing to rest one way or another. I took my shotgun and Cole on one of the quads, while Arnie took the lead on the other, and we rode down into the southeast field together. Arnie had stopped, and I asked if this was where the spot was. He said, no, it's over there. In other words, he didn't even want to ride close to where they had seen this thing. That's how frightened he still was over what they had seen. 
So the three of us got off the quads, and I, of course, was toting my side by side, and we slowly walked over to the area just ahead of us. As soon as Cole had said that's where it came from, my eyes were drawn immediately to numerous prints in the soil, which were definitely from some type of canine and were about five inches wide. These were bigger than any dog print I had ever seen, and there had never been reports of any wolves for as long as I've been alive. Now, I knew that my boys were telling the truth, and to be honest with you, I hadn't doubted what they saw. I was just wondering, as a parent, what to do if they had misidentified what they had seen. I'm going to fast forward here several months prior, to which I had spoken personally to every one of my neighbors, none of whom had seen anything like what my boys described on the land. All of these men, by the way, were regularly out on their properties in tractors and trucks taking care of business, and I thought surely that someone would have or should have seen something, but they didn't. We had about a dozen cats on our property, all of which lived in the barn, and their job was to keep the field mice and such down to a low roar, each one of them being named by the family. My wife, Lisa, was talking during dinner one evening, and she said she hadn't seen Herman in a while and thought he had died. Don't ask me why the cat's name was Herman. I didn't name any of them, but it was. The very next day, I was riding down into the southwest corner of the property in my truck when, for whatever reason, something caught my eye on the ground, which caused me to stop and get out. Lying in front of me on the ground was the gray head of Herman the cat. I could tell just by looking at it that it had been torn from its body, not cleanly bitten off. I should also mention that never at any time in the past had any of our animals been found dead on our land. We found skeletal remains of cats that wandered off to die in the fields, but never anything like this. I was now seeing. In the moment, a dark and eerie feeling began to take hold which I had never experienced on my land. I began to feel like I was being watched. I became very uncomfortable and went back to the house and told no one about finding Herman's head or what I had felt when I was in the field, keeping everything to myself. It was several days later while working in the barn that my wife had come out and said to me, Honey, is everything okay? You haven't been yourself lately. At that point, I told her what happened. Four days later, after the sun had long been set for the day, my shepherd began to bark violently. As I walked to the back door and opened to take a look, this was very unusual behavior for my dog, and he was going nuts. My shepherd weighed a good 125 pounds, and as I looked out, I could see him and the outline of another animal which appeared to be another dog or wolf running in the darkness. It was at least three or four times his size. I went inside, grabbed his leash and my gun, and everyone was asking me what was wrong. But I told them to stay in the house. Arnie, being the oldest, showed his young manhood by grabbing his twenty two caliber rifle to step out with me, which made me very proud of the boy. The two of us, with guns and flashlight in hand, made our way over to where I had just seen this thing dart away, and my dog would go no closer. Pulling on his leash, dragging me away from the area, I tethered my dog and Arnie, and I walked over together. Once again, looking down on the ground, there were these enormous canine prints, just like the ones I had seen in the field. This was the first time in all of my years being here that I had seen any type of predator evidence on my home's property. And for the first time in my life, I was fearing for my family's safety. Anything that big could easily kill a human or any other animal. And now I was worried. Since I now knew that this creature was in fact coming near my home, I had decided to thaw out some venison from my meat freezer. In effort to bait and shoot the beast, 
I elevated the motion detector on my rear light to hopefully pick up anything further out in the yard, which had previously been angled to catch the truck pulling up. And I began to set my baits. For two weeks, I set fresh bait intermittently. And I was sleeping in my recliner by the rear bay window, facing the outside, hoping that the light would wake me up, which it did. It was a Thursday night about 2 a.m., when I was awoken by that light, as I gathered my thoughts, I immediately peered through the glass, and there it was. I can only describe it as a hound from hell leaning over the meat in the dim light. Every time it lifted its head between bites, the light hit its eyes, and they were luminescent, red and wide set. The head on this thing must have been nearly a foot wide at the back of its jaws, and its white fangs jutted up and down without its mouth. As I tried to make my way out of the recliner and grab my gun, the monster's eyes were suddenly fixated on me. Seconds later, it dipped its head down to take another bite, and I stood up grabbing my gun. As soon as I grabbed it, the beast lurched its head forward and started to turn in a manner which told me that I had been found out. For whatever reason, in the heat of the moment, thinking all of my hard work would be for nothing, should this thing turn and run, I shoved the barrel of my shotgun right through the pane of the glass and pulled the trigger. This was strictly point-and-shoot, all-for-nothing gamble on my part, and as the shot rang out, I saw the hind quarters of this monster lift into the air. Having been hit by my load, it jumped in kind of a gimpy movement, indicating to me that it had been damaged and it moved off into the darkness. The whole household was awoken by the ordeal, and we spent the entire night looking out into the backyard. In the morning, as soon as it was light enough to see, I walked out by the bait and saw blood on the ground. In the days and weeks to come, I was unable to locate the body of the creature, even with the assistance of my neighbors. It wasn't until many months later that a friend, Greg, ran across the skeleton while turning his field under and called me to come and have a look. It was a massive skeleton of a huge canine, with some of the fur still attached. It measured close to six feet from the tip of its snout back, and it was enormous. I would have to say that, based on the skeleton of this beast, it would have weighed several hundred pounds. None of us had any idea what it was or where it came from, but we were sure this was the animal that I had shot. There was actually a lead pellet stuck in the hind leg, and the same leg seemed to have been damaged, more than likely, by the same shot. I'd never seen anything with glowing, wide-set red eyes prior to this event, nor have I since. What this was, I have no idea. Today's second part of the upload... In September of 1997, I had taken my two hounds out for a hike, with me just north of Vermilion Lake, which is due east of my home at the time in Eli. I was a couple of hours into the hike, with the dogs rummaging around here and there in the brush, and I had made my way into an area of open forest. It was comprised of tall trees with little very undergrowth, making it great for visibility as I hiked. Rascal was the first to bolt, and Sweetie followed. They were tearing it up into the trees when the two of them began to bark frantically. I started to jog to catch up, and as I finally had them in view, the two of them were darting around what was a large mound of black fur crouched on the ground. At that moment, there was no shape or form to what I was seeing, and the only thing that I could think was black bear that was either dead or lying in the woods. Still in a jog and edging ever closer to the dog, suddenly this black mass launched from the ground, chasing after Rascal on four legs. I knew then that I had looked at this beast from the rear. It had been lying on the ground, either sleeping or eating something, just like the dogs would on the rug. Now, Sweetie was 100 pounds, and Rascal, being the larger of my two, was all of 115. 
When this thing launched to fend them off, its size in comparison to the dogs dwarfed them. They appeared like two puppies playing with their mama. It was a gigantic black wolf such I had never laid my eyes on, and based on the size versus that of my dogs, I would say it weighed in 400 pounds or more. I had seen many wolves in the state. They always travel in packs, but this thing was alone in jet black. Its size was not that of a timber wolf, and neither was its build. It had absolutely massive body, and the head was covered in long black fur. The dogs were running in and on it, and then scampering away each time that it turned on them, all while barking relentlessly. It kept turning back to where it had been lying, obviously to protect some type of food from my dogs. I saw it numerous times from the side view, and its body was about six feet long, without its tail. With its back standing close to four feet from the ground, I don't know if it wasn't capable of running any faster, or if it just didn't think the dogs were worth the effort. But it more or less seemed to just trot after them rather than bolt toward them to bite them, acting more like we would chase a fly from our dinner plate. This scenario played out for about a minute before I called the dogs off and I left. Having made it back to my house over the next several weeks, I had described what had happened to a number of old timers and seasoned hunters. More than a few of them, said that it sounded like I encountered a dire wolf, a species which is said not exist anymore. I did a little research and saw it was said to have existed alongside the saber-toothed tiger in North America and had become extinct. Well, I'm here to tell you that what I saw was certainly not extinct and was not traveling in a pack. This was an enormous, vicious animal and it's living in Minnesota. Today's next encounter um, <laughs> is really crazy for me because uh, growing up in the Boy Scouts, being a Boy Scout, an explorer, um, our troop leader had a hunting cabin up in Peaked Mountain and we would just hike for days having the blast you know it was like summer camp was two weeks long with the option of going home but we used to just hike and there was these ponds called the Siamese ponds that you could see um on peaked and very beautiful I remember one time we were we actually hit the ponds and uh we saw some sort of uh it looked to me like a leech but i think it was some sort of eel or whatever the hell it was but it, it was just this ginormous leech come to find out they're um from up this way <laughs> lack of a better word sorry my brain went dense there for a minute but um this encounter is literally right where as kids we used to chill and have the time of our lives at boy scout and explore summer camp so it was the fall of 1993 i was hunting in an area known as the siamese ponds just to the southeast of a town named Baker Mills in New York State. This was actually my second day in, having had no luck the previous day. I was working my way in, heading towards Big Range Mountain on a different course for the day before. I had spent three hours in one location, having created a makeshift blind, not willing to repeat yesterday's debacle. I decided to break and move my position for the later part of the day. The beginning of the strangeness actually started on the previous day, having not seen so much as a squirrel in the woods. I have to preface what follows by saying that I have never hunted in this location before, 
So it's entirely new for me. But on day two, I was experiencing the same thing as far as lack of wildlife goes. I had located numerous game trails indicating that there were deer present and yet hadn't seen nor heard anything, not even a bird. Upon locating what I believed was another good spot to set up in, I made myself comfortable and waited. It was now late in the afternoon and having seen nothing and also knowing that I had a fairly good hike out ahead of me, I left. I was pretty much doubting back the way I had came in. Being only a degree or so off, my entry compass heading. When I stumbled on the strangest thing I had ever seen in the woods, I was coming up to what was a very small clearing in trees, in the middle of which was standing an inverted tree, which had been forcibly shoved into the ground with the root ball raised into the air. This tree, which still had reasonably fresh bark on it and dirt clinging to its root system, was shoved top first into the ground like a telephone pole. Its trunk diameter was about 10 inches, and it was approximately 12 to 14 feet, in my estimation, out of the ground. I leaned into it with all my weight and gave it several forceful shoves, but it didn't budge. Just how far it was into the ground, I had no idea, but it was most certain firmly placed, Without a way or a reason to weigh this thing, I would guess it had to weigh, at the very least, many hundreds of pounds. And as I said, this tree was not evenly entirely dead. As I stood looking at it, the bark still had freshness to its appearance and texture. I didn't see any evidence at the time in the form of tracks, equipment having been used, or even any sign of a hole having been dug to place it in. Having no idea when it had been placed where it was, and by whom or by what, I left those woods. The strangest thing about it, as if that in itself is not strange enough, was the way that I felt when I was examining it. I had the creepiest feeling come over me as I thought I was being watched. I heard and saw nothing, but I just couldn't shake the sensation that someone or something was staring me down. I can't quantify it in any other terms. It was simply an eerie feeling. Some time ago, I heard an interview on Coast to Coast AM, and I had really never given much credence to the existence of Sasquatch, but after seeing what I did that day, I am most definitely having second thoughts about the matter. There is no possible explanation in my opinion, as to why this type of thing would occur deep within the forest. Why would any individual go the trouble of performing such an act and cleaning up after themselves as well? And then there was the way in which I felt during my examining the tree. There is one other element that I should talk about. I was standing by the tree. There was somewhat of a stinky smell in the air but only when I was close to the trunk. And so, believe it or not, I put my face close to the trunk as one would smell a youngster's diaper, and the tree stunk. What all this means is anyone's guess, including now yours. Today's fourth part of the upload. Anyone who lives in these parts and has an interest in ghosts and the paranormal will tell you straight up Louisiana is one of the most haunted and spooky areas in the country. About six years ago, a couple of friends of mine formed a loose-knit group of paranormal investigators, and we have been looking into such activity to date in over 100 different locations. One such location was located near the Manchac Swamp where a wicked landowner, who had been whipping and brutally beating his slaves, a group of slaves, having had enough, turned the tables on him and killed him, after which they gathered all the weapons and things they would need from the farm, with their plan being to head out and free other slaves, forming somewhat an army of sorts to go out on the offensive. Well, as it turned out, they had got together a band of about 500 slaves, 
but their movement was quickly shut down. The neighboring landowners assembled themselves and put down the uprising. The suspected head of the group had his hands chopped off and was brutally beaten. And as an example to the others, who may think they would like to try the same, was thrown alive into a bonfire, being consequently burned to death. We had gone to the location of this homestead where it all began, and we came upon some real unusual paranormal activity in the form of responses on our equipment. After the night's session had ended, one of the questions we asked, did you go into the swamp? The answer to which was yes. So, we made arrangements with the locals to take us up to Manchek Swamp in order to further investigate the movements and whereabouts of these slaves. As it turns out, the local were aware of a couple of small ranchack dwellings deep in the swamp, as well as a small graveyard in the woods. One, of course, he had said that nobody but someone who was looking to hide would be living in these parts. There were any number of things in here that would kill you, including snakes, spiders, and mosquitoes, but I guess anything worth taking a chance on to escape slavery. We had made our arrangements so we would be in the area of the shack and the graveyard in the dark and began our trek into the swamp. This tributary or river on which we were traveling was all about 20 feet wide. When we were nearing the location, and the time was about 8.30 at night, suddenly one of our group said, I just saw a dark shadow run through the woods over there. We all turned in unison to look, but saw nothing other than the trees. She swore that she saw a large dark shadow running through the trees and heading in the direction in which we were traveling. The boat we were in was basically moving at idle and very quiet. We didn't have to raise our voices at all to speak to each other. We'd gone past the graveyard's location and moved down to where the shack was on the river's edge, nosed the boat onto shore. No sooner had we positioned ourselves in and around this tiny little shack, which was missing boards and overgrown with plants and vines, than did we hear deep within the swamp a loud howl that, to a man, made all our hair stand on end. It was very loud, and what had made the sound was anyone's guess. The owner of the boat said he had never heard anything like it in his life, and breached the subject of it being a Rougarou, a legendary swamp beast of Louisiana. We had gone from ghosts to swamp monsters in a matter of seconds. We set up our equipment and began to do some EVP sessions, asking if anyone was present with us and if they wanted to say something, and we received responses virtually immediately. There was no such activity that it was almost as if it was a group of people present that were just as interested in us being there than we were being them. When we asked how many people were present, the answer came back as 19, having thoroughly investigated the shack and its immediate surroundings. We entered back onto the boat and went back to the area of the graveyard to investigate. Here's where things get really weird. So we were standing amidst these small tombstones or grave markers in the dark with this river about 20 feet or so from us and nothing but the darkest of jungles around us. And as soon as we began to start up the EVP session, a loud crash came resonating out of the woods. It sounded like a tree being used as a baseball bat, smashing onto another tree's trunk. We just about jumped out of our skins at the sound of it. And before we could gather our collective composure, smack, it happened again and it sounded real close. All right, folks, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to today's upload. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. That one encounter that I was talking about where the guy had shot it and season goes by and he ends up finding it decomposed and finds his 
round. Just, uh, yeah, I wonder how many times that happens. I wonder how many times farmers um, have to go through that and don't say anything. You know, it's just a very strange kind of idea, but I think more than we care to know about. Actually, no, I'd love to know. Um, but I bet you it's more than we think. Anyway, guys, thank you once again. Your support is what makes this channel so special. It's nothing I do. You guys are the channel. So please stay safe, happy, healthy, ever vigilant, keeping an eye on your children, your loved ones, your pets, your friends. We know these creatures are real. We know they're out there. Please use the info we learn every day from each other to stay safe and to keep your family and friends informed. God bless you all.